Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me, once again, a good friend of mine, John Rubino. He runs the popular financial website, dollarcollapse.com, and I would strongly urge you to go there to avail yourself to some very excellent economic insights from John and others. Uh, he is a uh, co-author with uh, Gold Money's James Turk of the uh, collapse of the dollar and how to profit from it. And uh, more recently, he and James also teamed up to write a, a second book called The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. And John is also the author of a number, or a, a number of other uh, books, Clean Money, Picking Winners in the Green Tech Boom, uh, that was in, nine, in 2008. He wrote another one, How to Profit from the Coming Real Estate Bust in 2003. wasn't that timely. Uh, and then he wrote another one, Main Street, Not Wall Street, in 1998. And he also uh, has written for a number of prestigious publications uh, and currently writes for the CFA magazine. Uh, welcome, John. It's good to have you back again. Hi, Jay. Good to be back. Really good to talk to you again. Uh, you know, I, I would just say that people, Dollar Collapse is an excellent site to go to. Uh, you wrote several things uh, I want to talk to you about today. One is uh, the government's less than forthright statistics uh, concerning unemployment and gross domestic product. Uh, we've talked uh, with John Williams on this show about this in the past. Uh, can you uh, perhaps pass along your thoughts on, the, on this topic? Yeah, well, by, by the way, John Williams is really the go-to guy for this kind of thing. Uh, and he, he's uh, breaking down the government official statistics and coming up with more realistic versions of them. And the realistic versions are terrifying, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. on, on unemployment, for instance, uh, the U.S. has been reporting a steady decline in the unemployment rate over the last few years. And now it's down in the 6% range, which is really good. You know, that's, uh, that's about as good as we've been able to hope for for the last Yeah, we were of over 10% at one point there, weren't yeah. we? Yeah, yes. And, uh, you know, it looks like we're heading in the right direction. But um, that number is, is created in a way that uh, it is so inappropriate that it amounts to a lie. Mm -hmm. at, at this point, because what, what the government does is, say you lose your job and you, uh, you, you just can't find another job and you get disgusted and just stop looking. Well, the government takes you out of the statistics then. They no longer count you as part of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so the, the number of people who are working is divided by the number of people who um, are in the workforce. And uh, if the workforce gets smaller, that makes the unemployment rate look right. smaller. And so yeah. that's happening on a, a vast scale right now as people drop mm -hmm. out of the workforce because they uh, either they retire or they just flat out can't find a job and just give up looking. Yeah. And so, John, let, let me just, let me just uh, stop you there for a second. It is my understanding that when we compare current statistics with those of the Great Depression, in fact, they didn't count unemployment the same way. They actually looked at able-bodied people at that time. Which is what they should um, look at, because right. I mean, if you can work, you generally want to work want to in work, this yeah. world, right? Sure. And, uh, and, and so if we calculated unemployment the same way today as we did back then, the, the rate would be somewhere around 23% in the U.S. and rising. Mm -hmm. So we would be looking at a depression-level unemployment right now, after right. five years of um, a quote-unquote recovery. Right. And the world would look like a very different place if the, the biggest, most powerful economy was in a depression. Right, which it is, essentially. Yeah, yeah. We're just but, not recognizing it. We have to keep the animal spirits up there, John. Yeah. You know, we can't get <laughs> depressed. We can't call it a depression. We can't look at reality. We have to keep the animal spirits up there so people will keep spending and going into debt further, right, to keep things going. Yeah, that's that's probably the motivation for for a lot of these um, statistics that can only be called fictitious right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and GDP is another one that just came out um, a, a few days ago and showed a, a pretty dramatic drop in first quarter GDP. GDP is the the size of the economy, the amount of spending that's going on out there, and it, it uh, fell according to the government statistics by two point nine percent at a two point nine percent rate in the first quarter. But that's, when you look at how they got that number. Yeah, it's even much worse because they yeah. used an inflation number to adjust GDP uh, of only 1.2%. In other words, they were saying that uh, the current inflation rate is averaging about 1.2% a year. And uh, 
If you compare that 1.2% to home prices, which are up 10%, and beef is 9%, and eggs are 5%, and oranges 22%, and a lot of other things that we buy day to day are up dramatically more than 1.2%. So the, the, probably the real inflation rate is much, much higher. And when you deflate GDP by that more realistic number, you get something like a, a 5 or 6% decline in the size of the economy. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's deflation level. That's big, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So That's really um, big. You know, you know, John, when I was young, uh, and that was a long time ago, I remember well, they used to talk about inflation in terms of what it costs uh, to keep uh, and to take care of a family of four, to feed a family of four, keep a roof over their heads, you know, the basics in, in life and what you have to have to stay alive. I don't, they don't look at it the same way anymore, do they? No, they, they uh, since the 1980s have begun playing a lot of statistical tricks with yeah. inflation, where if something goes up, you know, one thing goes up, they take it out of the equation. Right. And, uh, and, and that's called substitution, where they assume that, well, if steak gets expensive, then we'll just switch to hamburger. But, of course, you're no longer measuring uh, a constant standard of living when you do that, right? Because most right. people would consider eating steak... Um, uh, an aspect of a higher standard of living than eating hamburger. And, but they do this over and over again with, uh, with anything that goes up um, to the point where it becomes kind of an outlier, they just take mm -hmm. it out. And then when, when products improve <clears throat> in quality, they make an adjustment for that. They call that hedonic adjustment. And that's, that's so subjective that right. it, it gives the government a huge amount of leeway in which to play games with these numbers. And, of course, they always play games in ways that favor a lower inflation rate. You know, you never see them making adjustments that lead to a higher inflation rate. And why is that? Because uh, a higher inflation rate is bad for the guys in charge. And a lower inflation rate makes it look like the people in charge are doing a great job of managing the dollar. Mm -hmm. And um, and. and According to John Williams at Shadow Stats, uh, the gap now between the way we used to calculate inflation back in the 1970s and the way we do now is 6 or 7% a year. Mm -hmm. So we would be up near double-digit inflation rates if we just continued to calculate inflation the way we did back in the days of Jimmy Carter. And again, you know, the world would be a very different place if the, uh, the world's reserve currency was being inflated away at a 7 or 8 or 9% rate. You know, mm -hmm. that, there would be absolute chaos in the global financial system. You, nobody would buy bonds under those circumstances, certainly not at 3%, like, uh, like, like the current markets um, pretend yeah, yeah. give yeah. you a real rate of return still. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, well, uh, if, if we were telling the truth, the world would be a much darker place right now. Well, would it or wouldn't it, John? I wonder, because on the one hand, if we had constantly told the truth and not tried to deceive ourselves through all this period of time, there would not have been this sort of euphoria, these bubbles that have popped up in different economy and different parts of the economy, the housing bubble, for example. I think the bond bubble now, the stock market bubble. Uh, you know, we, we have an economy that is basically not it, – it, we have – a mindset. I like to keep. I like to say that the, the government wants to keep us down on the mushroom farm, keep us in the dark, essentially, and and not allow us to know what's really going on. And in the short run, I think you're right that you know if people were to really wake up now and understand the dismal situation that we're in, uh, they would abruptly change their behavior. I think, uh, and and that would would cause a readjustment that would be very painful. But I think at the same time could be would be very productive long-term. Do you agree or disagree with oh, that? Oh, yeah. If we'd been telling the truth all along, we wouldn't have gotten into a lot of the trouble that we've gotten into. Right. right. But for, from the point of view of the guys in charge right now, for them to suddenly start telling the truth would, would be very bad for their careers and their <laughs> reputations and their personal fortunes. You know? It would so probably you, be good for a lot of us. It. It, yeah. it might be great for the rest of us. It may or may yeah. not. Who knows for it, sure. But it, let me it, ask it, you, though. It, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, in the, in the long run, it definitely would be better for us. But uh, yeah. in the short run, there would be a lot of pain involved. Right. And nobody wants to take that pain. Okay, John, no one wants to take the pain. We keep printing money. As soon as the stock market goes down a little bit, uh, or as soon as the in talk of interest rates or, or one thing or another, uh, the stock market goes down. David, uh, 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 David Stockman says the market throws a hissy fit, and it gets more money pumped into the system again. We have a stock market that is not reflecting that negative 2.9% GDP growth. The stock market has not been as strong as it was, but the equity market is still... Uh, is still is still 
looking pretty strong and pretty stable at this point of view. You know, you passed on an article to me, Rise in Legal Insider Selling Raises Yellow Flag. Now, generally, it's been my understanding, John, that when we come near an end of a bull market, the insiders, the guys that really know what's going on in the fundamentals of their company, are looking to exit, looking to get out. Is that what's happening now? Is that what this article is about? Yeah, Jay, the, uh, our stock market is essentially fake, and there are two pieces of insider activity going on that, that explains it. One is corporations are borrowing huge amounts of money, absolutely unprecedented amounts of money. They're, they're on a pace in, in the U.S. for a trillion dollars of new debt to be issued this year. And they're using a lot of that money to buy back their stock. And sure. so what happens is they, they leverage the corporation, they buy back the stock, and um, current earnings are then spread over fewer shares of stock, and it makes mm -hmm. earnings per share go up, which makes the stock price go up. Mm -hmm. And that's good for the guys running the companies because their performance is judged generally on the stock price. So they get bigger year-end bonuses, and they get to retire rich. And, but they, they end up leaving um, an over-leveraged corporation for their successors to take over. Now, at the same time, these same guys are selling their personal stock holdings. Mm -hmm. So they're using their, their other people's money via their corporation to buy back the stock and pump it up, and then they're selling um, their own personal stock to the people buying the stock. And what, what's happening, that, you know, what's, what, what they're doing basically is um, they're handing off their equities to the dumb money, you know, to corporate yeah. pension funds and to mutual funds and to individual investors who are the ones who will be burned when, um, when the buybacks eventually have to stop because corporations can't borrow any more money and the stock market loses all that support and tanks, you know, and the, the people that will be hurt, as always, are, are regular folks, you know, who, who weren't playing this game the way the insiders play it and right. who didn't understand what the dynamic was. Yeah, it's um, it seems to be the same old thing every every time, every cycle. And and the older you get, the more of these things you've seen, and the more predictable it becomes. I think. Uh, well, Jay, the, the thing is, that this is bigger than it's ever been before, though. So yeah. we're, we're doing it on a vast scale now, much much bigger than in, in times past. Yeah, well, I think you're right. Um, it, it, what happens here, John, to the bond market? I mean, uh, how long can uh, can um, uh, can these interest rates stay subdued? And uh, that, that's one question. The other question is, do you think that we are that the Fed is actually tapering? You know, it was uh, Paul Craig Roberts, I think, that was writing a piece, a very, I think, a very strong argument uh, that, in fact, uh, that uh, in fact we may not be tapering at all. That basically money is being recycled. You know, I think it was um, something like two trillion dollars that was lent to Europe, or they they call it swaps, but it was really a loan. To Europe, and now there was all of a sudden this huge amount of money, uh, treasury ownership that's coming through Belgium, I believe it is, a tiny little country that there's no way in the world they would have the money, the wherewithal to buy that level of treasuries. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, uh, it, it, are we really getting tapering now, John, in your view? And if so, uh, is what effect do you think it's having on the equity markets? It doesn't seem to touch the equity markets much at all, if at all. Yeah, Jay, I, uh, one of the, the scary things about tapering from the point of view of the government that it, it was that it, it might pull some of the support out from the financial markets and, and cause some kind of a financial crisis. So, uh, curiously, as the Fed has scaled back its own bond buying, in other words, it's pumped less and less money into the, uh, the U.S. banking system, mm -hmm. um, Belgium, as you said, has been buying almost dollar for dollar Treasury bonds to, to make up for the fact that the Fed is buying fewer. So if you just take those two entities, the U.S. Fed and then whoever it is in Belgium that's, that's doing all this buying, it's a wash. Mm -hmm. so, so just looking at those two entries, no, uh, there, there's no um, tapering going on at all. You know, the same amount of treasuries are being bought up just by different parties. And therefore, the same amount of cash is being pumped into the banking system worldwide. And that, in part, explains why stock prices haven't reacted to the fact that, uh, you know, otherwise we've got a very, fairly serious tightening going on on the part of the U.S. Fed. And normally that's associated with falling stock prices. 
um, right. that it hasn't happened. And, and, you know, the other part of it, of course, is that we, what we already talked about, where corporations are still able to borrow very cheaply, and they're mm-hmm. doing it, and they're using that money to, to buy equities. Mm-hmm. And, and there's also stories now about uh, some of the central banks around the world directly buying equities, just yeah. going in and buying 3% of every stock on the, the Helsinki Stock Exchange and, and presumably the Standard & Poor's 500 and, and, uh, and also in China and Japan. And, and that, of course, supports stock prices. So, the, you know, the, to the extent that central banks have unlimited firepower in the sense that they can uh, print as many new pieces of currency as they want to, if they're going to direct that to equities, they, they could elevate the equity markets for a really long time. Um, we don't know how this works because we've never been here before. We've never had the world's central banks directly intervening in the equity market in this yeah. way. So, no, I'm it's, sure it's, territory. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess some people think it may have started to happen a bit uh, uh, during the 87 stock market crash or following that when the um, plunge protection team was created mm-hmm. during Reagan's administration. It may have been uh, the, the, some of the first examples of it in the United States. It may have uh, sort of helped to keep the panic away and, and restore confidence in the market. Uh, so in the short run, it might have uh, it might have worked out seemingly okay. But again, I think what people don't really understand is the distortion to capital and the capital markets that's caused by this artificial creation of money used for whatever reason. You know, I have to think, John, during after two thousand eight, two thousand nine, all of a sudden the banks received trillions of dollars, and of course in different ways. First of all, push the interest rates down and actually pay banks to hold hold money. Uh, and, and then their cost of funds, of course, go way down, and essentially recapitalizing the banks by stealing by, from other people, by, by reallocating wealth, I guess is a way of putting it, picking, uh, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, and that seems to be what's been going on. But instead of capital, in my, my view of capital, is what you don't consume You're from your earnings or from your, uh, from your wages or whatever, that is legitimate capital. But the banks can go out there and and print trillions of dollars that then is thrown into the market that essentially uh, dilute the honest capital that was re, that was that was uh, allocated, and not only that, when you have all that money going in, it's the malinvestment syndrome that the Austrians talk about. You have all these bad bad things that are you have bad decisions made with respect to uh, investments and so forth. So how far and how long can this thing? Can this thing run, John? And um, you know, I see the uh, the BIS is critical now. Uh, they've come out and very critical of this quantitative easing and, and uh, uh, artificially low interest rates. And uh, you know, it is almost like treason among bankers. I'm not sure why the BS, BIS all of a sudden has come out and said this. But do you think there might be some revamping uh, or some move towards a more responsible, uh, honest monetary policy somewhere in the future here before this thing breaks down, or is it going to have to implode first? It probably has to implode first, Jay, just because so so many people um, benefit so tremendously from Mm -hmm. the status quo. Uh, There are huge fortunes being made out there now, and and fortunes are growing. (laughs) You know, yeah, sure, the one percent. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The 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 one tenth of one percent, especially. Yeah, and they're the ones who would make the decision to yeah. uh, to to switch to a new monetary regime, and so right. it's they not in their immediate the interest. Yeah, they yeah. have control yeah. of the system, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so so more than likely, the market has to impose some kind of discipline on the, um, the the global financial system via some kind of a crash, and there are just so many ways that could happen. Now, you know, you and I have talked catalysts in the past. Yes. And once you start going down the list of stuff that could go wrong, that could cause a cascade failure of the whole system, uh, you can do that all day long. There are yeah. dozens of things just waiting to happen. And so there's no way to know which one of them will happen and in, in which order you'll get the secondary and tertiary effects that, that bring down the system. But um, we've reached the point where the numbers just don't work anymore. So yeah. something big has to happen to uh, yeah. to restore faith in the currencies and you know we'll have to go back to some kind of a gold standard jim rickards has an interesting theory that, uh, that, that there will be an intermediate step here where, we, where the imf becomes the new global central bank and yes. uh, the dollar and the euro and the yen and the yuan are all replaced by sdr special drawing yes. rights at the yes. imf which which would just be an interim step because sdrs are only backed by fiat currencies right yeah, so it's, it's, it's just something just another yeah, paper system exactly. that sort of instead of making the dollar uh, the dollar or the euro the two primary ones it would mix a, a bunch of other lesser currencies probably in there as well yeah. So and and so we would go on as before, borrow, borrowing as much money as we wanted to, and and just um, 
doing it in SDRs instead of dollars and euros and yen. It wouldn't make any difference in the long run, but it might buy the global financial system a few years just because we're so easy to fool. <laughs> you know, John, you, you, you talk catalyst, and uh, yeah. because we don't have an unlimited amount of time here, I want to move on to another topic. But you mentioned in an article that you wrote recently, gold bugs' hearts are beating faster. In that article, you mentioned there were several, I think four different individuals, I'd like to ask you uh, perhaps to summarize their, their arguments why they think we're headed towards a bull market a return of the bull market in in gold but one of those was James Sinclair he he gave 30 reasons why uh, why this year is likely to be or this summer is likely to be the turning point for gold and many of those reasons are would be catalysts for the decline in the global economy I think as well right yeah he focused at least early in his list on geopolitics mm-hmm. and the the effect on the dollar of, of the stuff that's going on in the Middle East and elsewhere and and um, one of them was that uh, you know, the West is trying to impose sanctions on Russia over the Ukraine, and Russia is mm-hmm. responding by dumping its dollars. Right. And uh, let that trend continue, and then uh, if major countries stop using the dollar for trading, for instance, oil, then all of a sudden all these central banks that have 60% of their reserves in dollars will need to readjust down to 30 or 20% or whatever. And you'll see massive dumping of dollars on the global financial markets. And there, there, there may be 15, trillions, 15 trillion dollars overseas now outside of the U.S. money supply. And let those dollars come home because they're being dumped by central banks. And uh, you would see basically a hyperinflation in the U.S. And that's, that's what Sinclair is saying could very well happen in the not-too-distant future, because you've got the Middle East, where Saudi Arabia is mad at us. They don't need, necessarily want to use dollars anymore. Um, Russia would love to be able to bypass the dollar, and so you know they, they have the ability to do that now. So the question is, will they do it in the short run? Yeah, and, and, and the impact. And I know Sinclair really talks about it being a, a currency phenomenon. It's going to be uh, a loss of confidence in the dollar that likely would trigger something like that. That's certainly John Williams' thesis as well. It's really hard to see, um, you know, how you could get sort of hyperinflation when you have all of this weakness in the economy. But I guess the answer is, if the dollar really turns out to be worthless, then all of a sudden you could see why Rickards and others are thinking in terms of some kind of an intermediate step here to try to save the system. Yeah, yeah, that, well, that would be the response of the, the world's governments. If the dollar stopped functioning, functioning as a reserve currency, right. then just, they would just... just just pull a pull a bunch of them together and, and yeah. call them SDRs. Yeah, uh, exactly. Okay, uh, John. So with re, with respect to this article, and this of course is very near and dear to my heart as a gold bug. Uh, there were, in addition to James Sinclair, uh, you also mentioned uh, Richard Russell, uh, Grant Williams, and John Ng. Could you perhaps summarize uh, their arguments as well? Sure. Rich, Richard Russell's a technician, and he he sees gold. Uh, well, he saw gold break through the 50-day and 200-day moving averages, and to him that's very bullish and uh, and he predicts a uh, a short squeeze in um, in gold where the people who are short gold are, are just get steamrolled by its price going up and then they have to turn around and close out their positions which is buying pressure in addition to the original buying pressure and and that would send gold through the roof um, grant williams um, takes a look at the the size of the mining sector and concludes that it's extremely small compared to the, the amount of global capital that could flow into mining stocks if gold and silver suddenly make them attractive. And uh, if even 1% of the amount of um, liquid capital that's in the world right now tried to flow into mining shares, um, it wouldn't be able to do it. There, there just aren't enough um, liquid mining stocks out there to accommodate that kind of money. And so they would gap up hugely. You know, you'd see this gigantic, very quick bull market in my All right, stocks. All right then, John, my engineer is telling me just about uh, John Ng, if you could very quickly summarize his, his thesis. Yeah, and now he, um, he believes that a short squeeze is coming in gold as well and, and predicts um, um, $200 days for the gold market in the not-too-distant mm-hmm. future where gold just gaps up. And so the conclusion in, in all of this is that you've got to be in the gold market to participate in this. So you can't wait for it to happen because when it happens, it'll happen quickly. So take some positions now. All right, John. Uh, the money bubble, folks, read that, what to do before it pops. Uh, both uh, James Turk and John Rubino explain. Uh, and uh, go to John's website, uh, which is bubblecollapse.com. Uh, some good things coming up there as well. Thank you.